Okay, we are recording. At least it says we're recording. Hello and welcome to question and answer number 76. I am your host, Panyo Basa. And you probably didn't notice this at all, but I've been sitting here for several minutes trying to get this new OSB studio video recording software to work because for some reason it would not connect my video camera to the software until I finally had to delete the camera and then undelete it again, attach it again in order for it to work. And then I started doing the Q&A and immediately somebody started texting me, making these these loud booping noises. And so this is this is already like my third attempt at this in the last 15, 20 minutes. But I think it's working. I think we're doing this. And so I should just uh, answer questions. But first, I have a little announcement to make. And that is that I'm going to go on vacation. And so the next the next Q&A may be delayed. It may not be as punctual as they have been recently because my sweetheart and I are going to Ohio to visit her mama. And uh, I probably won't be back until the evening of the day that I usually record these. So if I'm a little bit late next time, or even as much as a week late, don't be surprised. And then we can have like this really nice four hour long Q&A two weeks from now or something. But anyways, I got questions here to answer. I've got a fairly lengthy list of questions. And so I should just uh, get started answering questions. And the first one is from Fred. And Fred says, can Nibbana be felt? Considering there are no aggregates left, would it be possible? The conclusion would be something has stopped. No, the conclusion would be becoming has stopped. And I really need to wipe my glasses because when you read becoming as something, you know that you're not reading it correctly because you're not seeing it correctly. So I wipe my glasses so that the, the smears are slightly rearranged. And so the question is, can Nibbana be felt? Considering there are no aggregates left, well, that's that's not necessarily true. Would it be possible, the conclusion would be some, be, I almost said something again, becoming has stopped. Okay, well, Nibbana can't be felt because Nibbana is not a cause or an effect and any kind of feeling would have to have a cause and Nibbana would not cause feeling, it would not cause anything. So, no, Nibbana can't be felt, but it is a mistake here to say that there are no aggregates left because an enlightened being still has the five aggregates, even though he's enlightened. And so I think maybe Fred here is talking about Pari Nibbana, like Nibbana after the enlightened being has died. But uh, then, I mean, still wouldn't be felt. So I guess the, the short answer to can Nibbana be felt would be no. It just it's just off the scale. See, feeling is here in samsara. Nibbana is off the scale of samsara. It's just not part of samsara, which is kind of the next question here. Fred's second question is, is Nibbana amongst the aggregates? But um, I guess he has this other question that I kept misreading. The conclusion would be becoming has stopped because there's a question mark at the end of it. And uh, yeah, becoming has stopped. In fact, becoming or bawa can just be a synonym for a karma. And so karma has also stopped, especially after um, the enlightened being has died. So anyways, let's just move on to Fred's second question here. Is Nibbana amongst the aggregates? And I mean, obviously it's, it's off the scale. It's not one of the five aggregates. There is no aggregate of Nibbana. So I assume the meaning here is He's kind of going with like the Mahayanist idea that Nibbana and Samsara or Nirvana and Samsara are in a sense the same. You know, it's like Nirvana is like the ultimate reality upon which the conditional virtual reality of Samsara is based. In which case, Nirvana would be sort of like Brahman or the spirit of God that just pervades the entire universe and is too real for us virtual realities to experience um, under normal circumstances. So, I mean, if you want to consider Nibbana to be ultimate reality, and then you would have to say that 
I mean, you'd be reifying it and calling it an it, which is kind of invalid. But still, um, if you want to view nirvana or nibbana as just ultimate reality, just all pervasive, you know, formless, infinite consciousness that is unmanifest, that kind of thing, then, yeah, it would be amongst the aggregates because it would be amongst anything that seems to exist because it would just be this pervasive ultimate reality that underlies everything. But uh, that's not exactly orthodox Theravada, but uh, Mahayanists and like the Vedantists do see their absolute as kind of an all pervasive infinite reality. And there were, there's at least a few verses in Theravada that are like pre-orthodox that also suggest this. But uh, they kind of uh, lost the debate in Theravada. So I'll just move on to the next question here, which is from Nature Cure. And Nature Cure says, what if Bhikkhu masturbates and don't tell anyone and just keeps it secret? Well, there's quite a few that do that, I would imagine. Um, and I mean, they're never going to have pure sila and they're just going to be digging themselves deeper and deeper into a, a hole of like ecclesiastical monastic discipline because every time you attend a ceremony with unconfessed offenses like every time you hear the Mocha recitation with unconfessed offenses you commit another offense and yeah it's I mean if you're going to do that sort of thing you're better off just not being a monk um, you know you just he's got serious offenses and then let's say a year later he decides to finally come clean and confess he's gonna make, do penance for the six days and six nights of the the masturbation and then he's got to do additional penance for the entire year that he concealed it because with a Sangha de Sesa offense you have to do six days and six nights of penance and plus the, however many days you concealed the offense without confessing it when you had the opportunity to confess but didn't and I've got dogs visiting me that you can't see maybe you see glimpses of them as they go in and out the door or something so yeah he'd be a, a sloppy unconscientious and relatively dishonest monk but he, he's not excommunicated because there's only four Parajika rules that will actually excommunicate a monk, plus maybe the unofficial fifth one of um, losing one's family jewels. So I'll just move on to Nature Cure's next question here. What if Bhikkhu gets caught smoking weed, I guess, in Burma? Well, it would depend on the circumstances. Like, um, I mean, if you got caught by the police smoking weed, I don't know what would happen. They might arrest him. If he gets caught by a very strict abbot, then he might just get kicked out of the monastery or scolded and told not to do it again. Or if he's at a really lax monastery, he might just start, they, he gets caught smoking weed, he might have to share. So yeah, it would depend on the circumstances. Although smoking weed in Burma, it's, I mean, the Burmese are much more conservative with regard to the use of intoxicants. You know, there's like a village drunk in most villages i would assume but i mean he's very low status you know it's it's kind of a stigma to to take any kind of intoxicants and um you guys settle down so yeah i mean it would be like being a junkie in america in the 1980s you know back before being a junkie was like you know it was like one of the protected classes or something so, yeah, if a bhikkhu gets caught smoking weed, you know, it just depends on the circumstances and who it is that catches him. So I'll just move on to Nature Cure's third question is, what if bhikkhu gets caught smoking cigarettes and probably nothing would happen because lots of monks smoke cigarettes openly, especially in Thailand because Anjan Mun was considered to be an arahant in Thailand, very famous, high-profile, saintly sage of a monk. You know, he, he, he was largely responsible for starting the Thai forest tradition like over a hundred years ago. And he was a chain smoker. I mean, he was literally a drug addict, which is ironic. So 
Yeah, there might be a few strict monasteries where the abbot is really a stickler and he has enough sense to know that nicotine is an addictive drug and the Buddha would not have allowed it if it if tobacco had existed in India in the Buddhist time. But and then he might just scold him and say you're not allowed to do that anymore. You know, something like that. But for the most part, monks just smoke cigarettes openly. And uh, it's just not considered to be a big deal, sort of like drinking tea. So I'll just uh, move on to the next question here, which is from You Know I'm With It. And You Know I'm With It says, Do you believe any of the romantics experience jhana? Well, maybe the drummer, who is also the vocalist. Ha <laughs> that was like a joke. I just told like a joke just now. So I guess I should have done like that. But um, um, but uh, with regard to like the romantic movement, that's like the 19th century. Um, yeah, I don't know if any of them experienced John. If they did, it probably would have been some kind of a spontaneous event. You know, like, um, oh, what's his name? William Blake. He was like a proto-romantic. He was like a forerunner of the romantics. It wouldn't surprise me if if William Blake, who was like a visionary, kind of a little bit on the nutty side, like a prophet, that he had experiences similar to jhana, maybe even genuine jhana, but it wouldn't be through meditation. It would just be this, this weird momentum that his karma had going and he would just go into these states, sort of like Socrates, you know, when he would just like freeze like a statue and just stand there for hours. You know, that might be some kind of jhana. But with regard to the romantics in general, um, yeah, I think they might have been a little too touchy-feely and, and just too worldly and secular. You know, like Percy by Shelley. I mean, mostly I'm familiar with the English romantics who are mainly like poets because I took an English lit class, you know, like Wordsworth and Coleridge, you know, Coleridge took a lot of drugs. He might've had some kind of similar, if similar experience. Um, Lord Byron, I don't think so. You know, you had people like Goethe. I don't know, I think Goethe was romantic, wasn't he? Maybe not, forget Goethe. So, I mean, do could any of them, I think some of them experienced trance states, probably drug-induced or just sort of nuttiness-induced, like in the case of William Blake, although nuttiness isn't necessarily a bad thing in some cases. I mean, we're all insane. They're just going with Orthodox Theravada. Putujino Umadako, you know, the, the, the common worldling is insane. And you stay insane up until you get fully enlightened. And even then, you might still act insane. And I'm checking to make sure this is recording. And it appears to be recording. It says it's recording. Now it's good. So I think I'll just move on to you know I'm with it's next question, which is, did you have sunscreen in Burma? And it is kind of refreshing to get like a really easy questions every once in a while. And uh, for the most part, I did not have sunscreen in Burma. Somebody gave me one once when I went to America. They gave me some sunscreen and I just never used it. I think I might even still have it like in a suitcase from when I was a monk from years ago. It's probably past the expiration date now. And there were, there were times when I probably should have used sunscreen. There was one time especially. I just shaved my head right before going on a trip. And, you know, when your, head, your scalp is just completely unprotected, that's not good. And then I was riding a sampan, riding on top. Monks generally ride on top of the sampan. And just going, you know, up the river with no shade in the tropics. It was, it was probably like January, but it doesn't really matter in the tropics. There's not all that much difference between um, summer and winter. So, yeah, I got really bad sunburn that time. In fact, it was certain places. There was one part right here on my forehead, especially where I'd put like Neosporin on it and it would clear up and then I'd, I'd stop using the Neosporin and it would reappear again, which is not a good sign. But eventually it did just fade out. I had a little bit on my nose too. But it was it was a bad sunburn that time. And you gotta be careful if you're, if you're of European ancestry and you live in the tropics. I mean, that's why 
Sri Lankans, even though technically, you know, they, they have Indo-European ancestry, they can be blacker than people that are called black in America, mainly because they're living at the equator, they're in the tropics, and fair-skinned people get skin cancer way easier than dark-skinned people do. So I guess you have to be, be kind of careful. But for the most part, it was so hot in Burma during when the sun was blazing that I would just stay in the shade. I'd be as nocturnal as possible. When I'd go for alms, I'd go really early in the morning so that I'd be back before the sun was high enough for me to be drenched in sweat. So I did have sunscreen for a while in Burma, but never used it. And uh, I did get a few bad sunburns. So I'll just move on to, you know, I'm with it's third question here. And I must commend my viewers that uh, they have been uh, very restrained in keeping the questions down to three per person per episode, which uh, is, is helpful. And it's, it seems to be manageable. And again, pray that I do not reduce the questions further. So, you know, I'm with it says, how did monks in ancient India keep track of time in jungle thickets with no reference to the stars or moon in order to sleep four hours a night? I'd imagine that's more difficult the longer the night is. Well, I mean, if they're in a jungle thicket, I'm sure they could, if they really wanted to get some idea as to how far gone the night is, they could walk out into a clearing. I mean, if they really wanted to know. Um, but then again, maybe it's just cloudy. Maybe it's the rainy season. It's just overcast all, all night. Then you just have to guess. But really, the only two times of day that a monk, like living in accordance with, you know, the ancient way that monks lived, the only two times of day that you really have to know is dawn and midday. Technically, dawn is when you can see the lines on the palm of your hand with your arm extended you know looking at the palm of your hand sort of at arm's length you can start seeing the the lines on your hand that means that it's dawn and it's okay to go for alms and with regard to knowing when midday is um in ancient times i'm sure they made kind of a primitive sundial where the only thing you really need to know is when midday is you know like when the shadow of the stick reaches a certain line and i did read a book um, it's the Surya Siddhanta. Just a second, the dog's doing something. You guys stop it. The Surya Siddhanta gives instructions on how to make like a fish sundial. It's, it's a sort of a fish design on the ground in the sticks in the middle. And then when the, the, the shadow reaches the, the intersection of these two semicircles, which is like the fish shape, then you know it's midday. And I, w I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of ancient monasteries before clocks were invented had something like that so they would know when midday is otherwise you just have to kind of eyeball it and and guess pretty much so but with regard to like nighttime and it's cloudy or it's just there's so much like forest cover that you can't see the sky you just have to guess. Maybe, you know, you, you just sleep. Like what I was doing at one, at one point in my life as a monk is just you sleep until you wake up. And then if I, if I, I had a clock at the time though. So if I had slept at least four hours, I'd have to just get up. And it may be they had something similar to that except without the clock where, you know, they just go to bed intent upon waking up, which is what you're supposed to do. And then you know, you just wake up because you're just programmed to want to wake up as soon as you've had enough sleep to get by, something like that. Or, you know, you just get like a, a natural rhythm so that, you know, like like I now just naturally wake up at like 530 because that's when I have to wake up to go to work. And so even on weekends sometimes when I can sleep in as late as I want and be just a lazy bum, I still am just automatically waking up at 5.30 or thereabouts just because you have like this internal clock going. And it may be that some monks would have that sort of thing going for them. They get into the habit of sleeping a certain amount every night. It just, it just starts happening as almost as a force of habit. So, I mean, they might have other ways of doing it. Maybe they came up with like a humongous or like an oil lamp that would burn out after 
approximately four hours. You know, you just put in four hours worth of oil or something. But uh, I've never I've never read about that. So I think I'll just move on to the next question here. This is from Pranav. And Pranav says, what would the daily routine of devas could be and the language they speak? Can devas speak all the languages that humans spoke? Well, that's kind of two questions here. I should probably uh, separate this. Okay. So the first question, what would the daily routine of devas be? And it would depend on the deva, I suppose. Um, I mean, like Tawatimsa, you know, they're dallying with their, their harems of celestial nymphs and strolling through pleasure gardens full of paradise trees and this kind of thing. Smelling the flowers, eating the celestial mangoes. You know, I, I doubt that um, they had like administrative jobs. Sort of like the Jehovah's Witnesses think that if you go to heaven, you, you just pretty much got this administrative job for, uh, for the kingdom of heaven. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. They, they do pretty much what they want to do. You know, if I was a Deva, at least once I'd want to just fly up to the moon and look around up there, see if there's any alien bases or anything. Um, or that, that, that Nazi base that's supposed to be there. I saw the movie. So, uh, what would the daily routine of Davis be? I mean, who can say? I mean, if you read the books, they're pretty much just wallowing in sensuality but uh every once in a while they'll come down and talk to the buddha or talk to a monk or you know they, they'll have some kind of mission that they'll do I, I assume it would be it's the standard you've got some super rich person who doesn't have to work for a living and they're living in this paradise you know surrounded by gorgeous women you know what are they gonna do but uh, that's just sort of a anthropomorphizing or, or anthropocentric view of the devas and some of them I'm sure are just completely unhuman and they're going to do st stuff that is just completely beyond our comprehension because I mean most devas probably do not look like people maybe the ones that are associated with planet earth because probably a lot of devas were humans in a previous existence and so forth but you get out you know beyond the human influence and I mean, you can have like deva beings that are just sort of like, who knows, just some sort of geometric pattern that's like fluctuating and, and pulsing and so forth. So what would that, what would the daily routine be of a pulsating geometric pattern? I have no idea. So I'll just uh, move on to Pranav's second question or the second part of his only question, which is the language they speak. Can devas speak all the languages that humans spoke? Um, it's my understanding that a lot of devas anyway, not maybe all of them, but they're just telepathic. That's just, you know, you, when you level up to deva level, you know, the, it unlocks the telepathy skill that you'd have to do a lot of meditative practice or just have a certain amount of psychic talent to be able to do that without, you know, reaching the next, this, this higher level. And the dogs are like snarfing on each other and they're playing. You guys calm down. Chill. So, um, yeah, it might be that they're just telepathic. And they um, they wouldn't even really need a language so much. as, Or maybe they do have languages. I don't... It's They can use any language they want, I suppose. And if you can read minds, then you'll know what they're trying to convey because you'll be able to... You know, you'll empathize with them or telepathize. So, can they speak all the languages that humans spoke? Maybe, I mean, I'm really not a deva, so I can't really speak for the devas. And um, if you read the, the suttas and get your information about devas from like ancient Pali texts and so forth, still it's very anthropomorphic and anthropocentric, and they're all gonna talk Pali. And I personally doubt that, you know, all the inhabitants of the heaven realms are speaking Pali. Um, they might not be speaking anything. It just might be a direct transmission of information from mind to mind. Uh, who knows what the language would be, whatever, whatever they want it to be, I suppose. And uh, could they speak all the languages that humans spoke? If they're telepathic, I assume 
they could communicate with a human in any language. So maybe I answered that question. There are a lot of I don't knows in the answer, but um, there you are. So I'll just move on to the next question here. And this is from RPAD, RPAD. And RPAD says, how Buddhist is Navayana or Dalit Buddhism? And I assume what he's referring to is um, there was a, a certain Mr. Ambedkar in India, who I believe has now passed away, who started a Buddhist movement in India. India, I mean, Buddhism in India was pretty much extinct. And then he revived Buddhism in India more than, than any other person, I'm pretty sure, by it was essentially a kind of social movement where he was taking, he was converting outcasts or Dalits. You know, they're, they're like out of the, the, they're untouchables, essentially. He was converting them to Buddhism uh, largely as a way of just getting them out of this untouchable status and, you know, allowing them to live their lives with some dignity and then self-respect and so forth. You know, they don't have to just be street sweepers and beggars and so forth. Um, so I'm not sure exactly to what extent um, this this movement by Mr. Ambedkar was just like activism and just mainly for the social purpose of uplifting the outcasts and the, the untouchables and, and to what extent there really was serious Buddhism where they're really taking it seriously and maybe even being ordained as monks and so forth. Because, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be of limited seriousness as a Buddhist movement if you don't have any ordained renunciants. Because that is really the name of the game in Buddhism. Is, I mean, that's mainly what it, was, what it was intended for, was renunciants. So, yeah, I'm not familiar enough with the movement to know to what extent it's, it's really a serious Buddhist movement and or to what extent it's like a social movement for the sake of bettering the, the plight of the untouchables. You know, I'm, there's both of those involved. You know, there's and it wasn't just totally fake Buddhism, I'm sure. But to what extent it really is a, a serious Buddhist movement for the sake of promoting Dhamma rather than promoting the social welfare of a certain low class in, in India. So yeah, I'm not the best source of information on that. So with regard to what the devas do in their spare time and, and also the Ambedkar um, Buddhist movement in India, I'm, I'm really not qualified to give a really an excellent answer. And so I'm just not gonna do it. If it's impossible, I'm not gonna do it. You gotta draw the line somewhere. So next question is from Sanguine Ultima. And Sanguine Ultima says, what would you re recommend telling persons who adamantly deny that Buddhism is a religion? I hope that you have no further recording issues in the future. Yeah, I hope so too. I might have to just delete my my video link and, and then re-add it every time. But um, it seems to be working now. At least I'm not looking at a black screen. So getting back to his question though, what would I recommend telling persons who adamantly deny that Buddhism is a religion? Well, with regard to a lot of Westerners, it's not a religion. With regard to a lot of Westerners, it's like a, a philosophy, sort of a meditative way of life, you know, that sort of thing. But to you go to a, a traditional Buddhist country, and it's certainly a religion. It's definitely a religion in Burma. I mean, the, some people say that a, re, a religion implies that, this, that you have to believe in God, but I mean, Buddhism, um, I mean, to that extent, it's, it can be held up as an example of an atheistic religion. They believe in small g gods, but they don't really have power over us. And, you know, there's no creator God that created us or created the universe or any such thing. Um, but still, I mean, the Burmese people, they've got their rituals, they, they, they pray, you know, they, it's, it's, it's essentially a religion. It's, it's faith-based. It's not based on, you know, empirical observation in most cases. They're just born and raised into it. They're taught how to do the simple chants when they're toddlers. 
know, they learn how to bow to monks and take five precepts and all that when they're little kids. So, yeah, I mean, it, it can be just kind of a philosophy and a meditative way of life for some people, including some people in Asia. But, I mean, for most Buddhist people, it, it is a religion. So, I mean, it may not have started off as a religion, but it has been turned into a religion in probably most Buddhist cultures because most people in any culture are not like spiritually or intellectually or philosophically advanced enough to just accept it as a kind of mystical philosophy and, and like a, a yogic practice. You know, they've got to they've got to have their beliefs and their rituals and so forth. Just they just take it on faith and that's pretty much religious. I mean, it would depend, I guess, on the definition of religion. I didn't look it up, didn't look in a dictionary on the definition of religion. There's probably more than one definition. But um, yeah, I mean, Buddhism is not a religion is mostly a Western thing or it can also be kind of a. Um, I don't know, kind of a talking point for Burmese intellectual scholar monks who think that Abhidhamma is, is like, you know, ancient Indian science. So that, you know, an Abhidhamma scholar might consider himself to be a kind of scientist. But, um, you know, he accepts Abhidhamma on faith, although most scientists accept science on faith too, which makes science kind of an atheistic religion also at least for a lot of people, including a lot of scientists. But it depends on the actual definition of religion. And uh, I haven't, I didn't look it up. I, I probably should have. And I'm afraid to look it up now on the, on the computer screen because it might mess up the recording. So, so I guess what would I recommend telling people who adamantly deny that Buddhism is religion? Yeah, well, maybe a lot of Westerners and a few Easterners do not uh, adopt a religious approach to Buddhism, but most Easterners and quite a few Westerners do really adopt Buddhism as just like a faith-based religion. And they're, they're praying to the Buddha and bowing to the statues and chanting the praises of the Buddha and just believing stuff that there's no way they could possibly prove or, or even look up really to verify it other than looking into a an ancient text that just says that's just the way it is. So, yeah, I think the first thing I would do is uh, look up the word religion in a dictionary and then just uh, compare that with, with Buddhism. And, uh, I mean, that would, that would be pretty clear-cut, you know, simple way of determining whether Buddhism is a religion. I mean, if you look up Buddhism... In the dictionary, it might even say that it's it's a religion founded by you know Gautama Buddha in the Ganges Valley or something. And that would be pretty good. When a dictionary is calling Buddhism a religion, that would be good evidence. So I guess I'll just move on to the next question here. This is from Crave Minerals, and Crave Minerals says, "What were your daily interactions like with fellow monks and other practitioners in Burma?" Sorry if this question has been asked a lot. Um, no, actually, it hasn't been asked a lot. So I take a sip of my excellent black cherry and plum beverage. Uh, and I commenced answering this question. What were my daily interactions like with fellow monks and other practitioners in Burma? Well, it depends on the, the fellow monks. I mean, I mean, most fellow monks, you know, I just, you know, you bow to them if they're a senior monk. You go to... Uh, you know, go do the, the Padimokha ceremony with them on Uposata Day. You know, every two weeks, you've got the Uposata ceremony. All the monks gather together. And most of them I just didn't really speak to much. Um, didn't have much interest. I mean, when I first came to Burma, I didn't speak Burmese. And nobody at the first monastery I lived at spoke English. And so I was having to communicate with one monk who had some formal schooling at a, at a monastery school and we were communicating in essentially broken poly and so i would just go to him if i needed anything you know you, you gotta find another monk and make confession to them if you've broken a rule that kind of thing but um 
Yeah, I mean, I had a few monks that were friends, and we'd hang out like friends, especially uh, Western monks. I mean, it's way more interesting hanging out with a Western monk than with an Eastern monk. At least it was in Burma, because the Burmese, they're a traditional society, and they all have pretty much the same point of view. And so you don't really meet any unusual characters, I mean, as a general rule. You know, you don't really come across any really out there points of view, unless it's just so nutty that you can't take it seriously. So, yeah, I mean, you, you meet up with a Westerner, you might just stay up all night talking because you don't really, you don't get much chance to talk in English about anything of interest with, with uh, you know, Burmese villagers and so forth. Um, yeah, so it depends on the fellow monks. I mean, some of them would be friends. Western monks you treat different from Asian monks because, you know, they just come from a different culture and so forth. Um, some monks I didn't like very much. Some monks didn't like me very much. We just kind of you know, steer clear of each other. And some monks, I mean, I didn't want to have anything to do with them because most monks in Burma, they're really not conscientious monks. They're just following along what everybody else is doing. And, you know, they're just breaking rules all over the place most of them handle money and you know, a lot of them are just like eating dinner and this kind of stuff and you know i just i don't just don't want to have anything to do with that so i just for the most part i avoided um asian monks or at least like burmese monks uh, after i had enough seniority i just went off and <clears throat> lived alone in the forest and just kind of stayed away from other monks so stayed away from monasteries so, I mean, every once in a while you meet somebody who's friendly and nice and you just have a conversation with them and, you know, everything's fine. So, I guess I answered that question. Daily interactions, I mean, um, a lot of time I wouldn't, I wouldn't have daily interactions with fellow monks and other practitioners because I'd be, you know, off by myself out in a forest cave or something. So, I'll just uh, move on to Crave Minerals' next question, which is... It is said that monasteries attract the criminal, the insane, and the wise. Does this sound true to you according to your experiences in Burma? Can't remember where I heard this quote. Well, it does attract some wise people, relatively wise people. With regard to the criminal and the insane, not so much. I mean, I've met, I've come across a few like crook monks um, I've come across a few nutty ones too, but uh, I think you're going to have more insane Buddhists in the West than in Asia, um, like proportionally, proportionately speaking, just because Buddhism is kind of on the fringe in the West, and so it attracts people on, that are on the fringe. Whereas in Burma, it's the, the normies or the Buddhists as a general rule. Um, I had one American monk tell me that at his monastery, which was in Sagain, um, in Burma, that uh, he was woken up in the middle of the night with some loud yelling and splashing. And he went out and looked, and there was a monk who was just splashing around in this big pond yelling. And it turned out that he was he had been ordained just like a week or so previously and he was an alcoholic and was going through the dts he was like trying to cure himself of alcoholism by being ordained as a monk and he was just kind of flipping out that kind of thing happens but uh yeah i mean there are some some nutty monks out there and koyin g's are even more inclined to be nutty Koyin Ji's are, it's like a, an ordained novice. It's sort of like in minor orders, like in, in Catholicism, it would be called taking minor orders. It'd be a, a, an adult novice who only has to keep 10 precepts plus the Sekia rules. And uh, some of them are pretty nutty. You know, and, and they can just, they got like the Te Ingu tradition in Burma has some really weird ideas that, you know, it's like, reading these little pamphlets by the Thea Ingu, from the Thea Ingu monastery, at least from one Seattle, the Thea Ingu monastery, talking about how AIDS is caused by eating too many chili peppers and this kind of thing. Let's see. So, 
Yeah, it said that monasteries attract the criminal, the insane, and the wise. That might be more true with regard to Catholicism, and it may be a, a Catholic saying that that, that uh, Crave Minerals heard the saying. It was probably like a Catholic saying. But the Burmese, um, yeah, I mean, maybe the criminal, the insane, and the wise are all in equal proportions. Maybe somewhat more wise monks than criminal monks or insane monks. But the really nutty ones, they just won't get ordained. Most most abbots will not ordain a, like a really nutty monk. And the, and the criminal types, they're not really interested in becoming monks. Um, except um, in America, like um, in Stockton, California, there was a Cambodian monastery there. And the, the Sangha Raja of Cambodia lived there in exile and he was over 100 years old at the time this was like the early 90s and actually just as an aside yoda from the star wars movies was based largely on this this cambodian this old cambodian monk but what happened was in stockton california there's a lot of gang violence a lot of gang activity and some of these gangs are like cambodians you know, Southeast Asians like Vietnamese gangs and Cambodian gangs. And when the heat would start getting too hot, you know, like the police are like investigating, you know, questioning about a certain gang member, he would often hide out by ordaining temporarily at a monastery. So this same monastery where the, the, the Cambodian Sangha Raja was living, you had like temporary monks who were gang members who had like a gun hidden under their, under their, under their bed, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, you get just the broader spectrum in the West than you do in, in Burma. Because partly, you know, Burma, Buddhism is on the fringe in the West, and so you, it attracts more fringe elements. Whereas it's just mainstream in Burma, and it's very traditional and conservative, and so there's not nearly so much wildness in in this craziness going on. So, I mean, it does happen though. And in some monasteries, you know, they might be uh, like alchemists or something there where you get into some weird stuff and, you know, you might have some unsavory characters who join the Sangha because they want to get psychic powers so they can destroy their enemies or something, but that's rare. So I'll just move on to Crave Minerals' next question here. And that is, are you familiar with Rupert Sheldrake's theory on morphic resonance? Any thoughts? And then he says here, if not, here's a wiki quote. Quote, Sheldrake's morphic resonance posits that memory is inherent in nature and that natural systems inherit a collective memory from all previous things of their kind. Sheldrake proposes that it is also responsible for telepathy type interconnections between organisms. He is often described as a pseudoscientist, but I think it makes a lot of sense, makes sense of a lot of things. Okay, and then I think it's interesting to consider how private practices of meditations, contemplations, and sila could have subtler effects on others and one's surroundings besides the obvious ones. Well, I read one book by Rupert Sheldrake, which was The Science Delusion, where he's essentially Make, you know, taking pokes at mainstream science or scientific realism, you know, he, he really just bashes the idea that science has pretty much gotten everything figured out. There's just a few gaps still. He's, he's just calling bullshit on that. There's like basic assumptions that science gets wrong, according to Rupert Sheldrake. And this morphic resonance, I assume that would be responsible for there's a, a well-known... Um, phenomenon like a certain kind of crystal it doesn't exist yet science hasn't isolated this crystal yet but then once it is discovered or somebody has managed to make one of these crystals it gets way easier and all of a sudden they just start appearing you know in laboratories around the world and it gets easier and easier until after 20 years you can have you know seventh grade science class forming these same crystals that uh, it took you know, some brilliant scientist in some, ex you know, highly funded laboratory to make the first one, and now it's it's easy. And it'd be similar to, you know, it's like there's a certain subatomic particle 
is never never found in like bubble chambers, you know, particle accelerators, anything like that, until somebody isolates one. You know, you got one science, one scientist, he discovers, he postulates the existence of this thing, he discovers it, and then all of a sudden, other scientists start seeing the same subatomic particles. So that might be what Sheldrake is referring to as like morphic resonance. At least there'd be two examples of it, possibly. So, yeah, I mean, it is it is possible. I don't know how it would work. I'm not sure if Rupert Sheldrake knows how it would work. It's like science is just observing patterns that then you can predict phenomena in the future based on you know the, the behavior of phenomena in the past. And, and you just assume that things are going to continue to follow the same laws of nature that they followed you know 10 years ago or one year ago or whatever that they just don't change which is an article of faith in science i mean you think that you know everything else can change why not laws of physics so let's see here i think i'm kind of rambling am i familiar with rupert sheldrake's theory on morphic resonance any thoughts yeah it is possible it helps to explain certain things but um yeah, I, I, I mean, like I just said, I, I'm not sure if Rupert Sheldrake himself can fully explain how it works. It just seems to be the case that it does work in certain cases. So, and then telepathy type interconnections between organisms, that that might be morphic resonance. Um, well, I mean, in a way, he's still adopting kind of a um, um, more or less materialistic, you know, scientific realist approach to the universe. And if you're just an idealist and you consider everything to be a kind of manifestation of consciousness, then that makes telepathy type interconnections way easier to explain because, you know, the universe is a manifestation of consciousness. Still, it doesn't explain exactly how it happens. But, I mean, science is better at explaining the what than the how in, in many cases. So, I don't know if I answered that question or not. I am familiar with Rupert Sheldrake to some degree. Like I said, I read one book by him. And I've read about him in a few other books. But, um, I mean, he just has interesting ideas. And, I mean, I do, I do appreciate people who are critics of scientific realism because I really think that scientific realism is a kind of either a religion or a pseudo-religion in the West. Um, it's, it's kind of losing ground now just because just hysterical emotionality is, is just running rampant. And, and, and like people can just, you know, we got postmodernism where truth is just a cultural construct anyway, so they just cook up these wild theories and and champion those without necessarily any kind of basis for them other than wishful thinking or bias or whatever. But uh, yeah, I'm just rambling now, so I think I'm going to move on to the next question. This is from Lieberlam. And Lieberlam surprisingly asks a, an easy to understand question because usually he's, he's like, you know, it's sort of like geared to asking questions or something where everything is, is really complicated and cerebral. But here it is, it's relatively simple, <clears throat> which is as follows. Do you consider it likely that any Jain in the entire history of Jainism actually did the death ritual of the Ayogi without suffering? My guess is that the decomposition process of sitting in full lotus is slow and grueling. Well, first of all, I would point out that I don't think that they sat in the full lotus. At least if you read the, the polytext that's describing how Jains and Ajivakas would, would essentially commit suicide after they believed that they had eradicated their karma. You know, that's, that's the goal for, for a Jain or an Ajivaka, especially a Jain, is you just delete, you erase, you burn up all of your karma. You don't make any new karma. And when you think that you're, you're karma free, then you then you kill yourself. But you can't do it violently because that would create new karma. So essentially, they would just go off into a, an isolated area and just squat down on their haunches and then just remain in that position until they were dead. And probably the first thing that would get them would just be like 
um, dehydration, kidney failure. I mean, you you die of uh, water, you know, water deprivation before you die of malnutrition or starvation. You know, it'd just take a few days, especially in the, you know, on, like in the hot season when you're just profusely sweating. It wouldn't take very long. So I don't think they would sit in the full lotus, although maybe some of them did. But uh, when the polytexts describe it, and I think I've read Jane texts that describe it also, is you just squat down. And they used to use that as a kind of self-torture device also. And any of you who really are skeptical that just squatting on your heels is a torture, self-torture device, try it. Just remain, like try and watch an entire movie just squatting on your heels. And you're going to find out that things start burning and hurting after about probably less than 30 minutes. And for you to just stay in that position, it, it really can be torture. Because, I mean, I've had to remain squatting for like an hour straight going through some long ceremony because you're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to squat down um, to, to do ceremonies. And if the ceremony takes an hour, I mean, it's like you are in agony by the end of that ceremony. So, but I mean, that's, that's not the question here. I'm just uh, sort of uh, adding something to this. But the question is, do I consider it likely that any Jain in the entire history of Jainism actually did the death ritual of the Ayogi without suffering? Well, yeah, I think it's possible. I think uh, the Ajivakas did something similar also, where you think that you're essentially enlightened or as close to enlightenment as it's possible for a human to get. And so you've exhausted your karma. They believe that they've exhausted their karma. And if they really believed that they had exhausted their karma, I'm sure that you know they'd be in a kind of altered state of consciousness and accept any kind of pain with, if not joyously, then at least with just serene equanimity. Because... I mean, you got to bear in mind that these people were torturing themselves before this. You know, that was like part of their spiritual practice was self-torture. And so, you know, a little more self-torture at the end is, is going to be nothing new. And they're just used to it. And dying of, dying of thirst, dying of dehydration, I assume it's really not that horrible. I mean, I mean, it's not good. I'm sure it's achy, but I mean, there's probably lots more unpleasant ways of dying than just sitting there or squatting there until you, your kidneys fail. I mean, you probably get really sick before you died, but I mean, they're just so used to it. I mean, that's what they did for a living is, is just torture themselves and endure misery, like physical pain and so forth. So, yeah, my guess is that... Um, Probably quite a few people of the Jains and the Ajivakas who believed that they had exhausted their karma and you know they were they were going to go into heaven or or into whatever state they they were expecting for the you know the enlightened sage of their tradition. You know, I'm I'm sure that uh, they would endure a little more like extreme discomfort and unpleasantness right up to the end without much difficulty. So, I think I'll just move on to the next question here. This is from Erin. And Erin says, I noticed on some of your Christian videos, you get spammed in the comments by Christians attempting to convert you or damn you too for doing a critical analysis of Christianity from a Buddhist perspective. How does the Christian behavior of damnation, hellfire, proselytizing, or sending out missionaries to convert people differ from Buddhist behavior or Dharma? Incidentally, the above-mentioned behavior is pretty much the same behavior we see from the atheistic indoctrinated left these days. Um, there are some narrow-minded Buddhists out there who will mainly attack other Buddhists just because they're saying, you know, you are shameless and you're, you're, you're teaching wrong view or you're, you're not practicing correctly, that kind of a thing. So that kind of mental state, you know, sort of like narrow-minded intolerance um yeah that can be found in buddhism also although buddhism is is not as intolerant as christianity um i mean early christianity was so hysterically intolerant that it pretty much just abolished and wiped out all other spiritual traditions in the west 
Um, Fortunately, Christianity no longer has the power to just persecute other systems into oblivion anymore. Now it's like like Arian says, it's like the atheistic indoctrinated left has taken up and taken the baton. You know, they they've taken up the torch in that regard. Um, but I mean, in Buddhism, a good person can go to heaven regardless of their religion, so long as their religion is teaching them to be, you know, moral and generous and honest and so forth. Um, and Christianity and generally considers heaven to be the highest state. And so Buddhism, you know, they say, well, Christians can go to heaven, Buddhists can go to heaven, Muslims can go to heaven, but heaven isn't the highest state. And the official position of Buddhism is that only Buddhists can become fully enlightened and attain nirvana, and I'm skeptical of that. I don't think that only Buddhists are capable of becoming enlightened. Although Buddhism is one of the best systems for leading you towards enlightenment. Because other systems like Christianity, they don't even have a concept of it. At least some schools of Christianity have no concept at all you know it's just like nobody is worthy of heaven it's only the grace of god that's going to get you there nobody's perfect that kind of thing so becoming fully enlightened is just it's just not an option for them it's just not on the list of possibilities so trying buddhists yeah they generally don't try to scare followers of other religions with you know threats of damnation and hellfire um, in order to convert them to, to Buddhism. I don't know, Buddhism is just has more equanimity and less hysterical intolerance than certain other systems. Although not all Christians are trying to convert people to Christianity out of hysterical intolerance. I mean, a lot of them, it's out of compassion. They really believe they've found the way to heaven. You know, they are saved and you have to be a Christian to be saved. And so out of compassion and goodwill, they'll try to convert other people to Christianity um, and there's some of that in Buddhism also, like and the Emperor Ashoka sent out missionaries in all directions trying to spread the Dhamma, which is, is a good thing. But generally you do it through more subtle means than, you know, threats of damnation if you don't. So, I mean, what's the question here? Maybe I should... Uh, Figure out exactly what the question here is. Okay, how does the Christian behavior of damnation, hellfire, proselytizing, or sending out missionaries convert people differ from Buddhist behavior or Dharma? Okay, I think I pretty much answered that. You know, there's a little bit of threats of damnation and hellfire, mainly with other Buddhists. You know, they think that, you know, you're a bad monk and you're, you're doing the wrong thing. You know, I got, I got some of that when I, back when I was a monk. Um, you know, you, you're going to... You're going to go to hell or something. Um, and then, I mean, there are Buddhist missionaries. It's just that they're, they're not like going around knocking on doors so much. But, um, you know, they're more laid back, more casual about it as a general rule. So, I mean, I was associated with a family in Bali that were very wealthy. This is in Indonesia. And they were like trying to spread Buddhism in Bali. And they were doing a good job of it too. They had, they had established a number of Dharma halls and monasteries and so forth, but they were doing it just through building these huge Dharma halls and inviting monks from like Burma or Thailand to come and stay there. And that would be sort of a nucleus for starting a Buddhist community in the area. And they did that in various places throughout, through Bali, which is, uh, I guess it's a, better way more I mean it's more expensive than going around knocking on doors like Jehovah Witnesses you know it costs a lot of money but um, it's probably a better way of going about it and the hysterical intolerance thing is it, it's uh, it's really not a Buddhist attitude it's certainly not endorsed in Buddhism although there are some fanatical Buddhists but uh, it's not nearly as normalized in Buddhism as it has been in certain places at certain times in Christianity and my nose is itching really bad very itchy which is kind of strange I gotta keep rubbing it uh, 
Okay then. So I hope I answered that question. Man, that's kind of a subtle, kind of diffuse kind of a question that sometimes I'll, I'll do my best to answer it and it's still I'm not 100% sure that I answered it. Okay, so I'll just move on to the next question though, because as I say, we've, we've got quite a few questions today. Getting up, uh, getting up close to 40 of them, I think. <clears throat> so this next question is from Son of the Father. And Son of the Father says, What is the idea or notion of the simulation, or that we are living in a simulation, referring to? It's a persistent meme like flat earth and fake moon landings. Um, yeah, I, I think he's saying this because... I think it, it may be in the last video that I said that we're living in a simulation, that this is not reality. But I'm not implying that we're in a computer, that this is not a computer simulation. We're not living inside some seventh grade alien, you know, some, some alien child who has created this universe as part of a science project. Nothing like that. We're not living, you know, it's not like the Matrix, literally. It's not inside a computer, but it is a simulation in the, in the, to the extent that it is a dream. You know, the Buddha, Buddha literally means awakened. And so the implication is that the Buddha was awake, but we're still asleep. That everyone else that isn't fully enlightened is still asleep. And so presumably we are all dreaming this. And that's a, a metaphor that is used more in Mahayana than Theravada, I think. But... Um, <clears throat> Also, like the Hindus believe that this entire world, or some Hindus, some Vaishnavite Hindus think that the god Vishnu is asleep on this big lotus flower and he's just dreaming this world. And that, that's a simulation because it's not real, it's just a dream. So, yeah, there are people that believe that we are in a literal computer simulation. Um, you know, that's, they, they use that to to explain Fermi's paradox of why we've never come into any contact with other intelligent life in the, in the universe, that kind of thing. And um, with regard to the flat earth and fake moon landings and so forth, I mean, there's going to be people who are going to take a contrary position with regard to anything. Just anything. Any official narrative has got to be false in the opinions of some people. If it's the official narrative, it's some sort of evil globalist cabal or, or some kind of cabal that is just cooking this up in order to mislead people and, you know, exploit them and, and on and on. So what is the idea or notion of the simulation referring to? I mean, with regard to the people who think that it's a computer program, that we're in a computer, then that's pretty straightforward. You know, they, it's, we're in the matrix literally. But um, my notion of a simulation is that it's essentially a dream, that it's not the highest reality, that if you wake up, then you're in a higher level of reality than you, you are now, that right now is really not full consciousness. It's like when you're dreaming a dream at night, you think you're awake, you know, you think you're fully awake, but then when you wake up, you realize that you weren't awake and it, it was sort of darker and, and you know, narrower, you know, the whole world you're living in. A lot of people just dream in black and white and there's less law and order. There's less vividness to most dreams. <clears throat> and it's just going to be sort of that. It's another quantum leap beyond that to uh, a higher level of reality, which probably still isn't you know, ultimate reality. But the Buddha, who was fully enlightened, presumably experienced ultimate reality. He was no longer in any kind of simulation. But so long as you're in samsara, even if you're in a high heaven realm, it's still a simulation because it's not ultimately real. It is only conventionally real or virtually real. So it's a virtual reality but it's not a computer generated virtual reality. It's just a, a mind generated virtual reality. And uh, I'll try to avoid once again, you know, bringing up the block of marble and, and you know, how just sort of certain patterns contained within the block of marble are so complex that they become 
um, self-referential and start thinking that they are, you know, intrinsically real and separate when actually they're not. And I just said I wasn't going to bring that up and then just immediately brought it up. So, yeah, but I, I won't I won't really elaborate on that because I've talked about it a number of times. So I'll just move on to the next question here. This is from Siovaksh and Sipad Zidana. And Siovaksh and Sipad Zidana says, how much of a difference does sense restraint make on practice as a lay person? For example, how much of a difference will not having sex and not watching entertainment make? I think it makes uh, quite a lot of difference, actually, especially for <clears throat> someone who is not an adept. Like, um, if you if you renounce the world, and really this this sense restraint, it's it's like step step two of renunciation. You know, you renounce the world and you go off into a forest, which is, it's relatively speaking, sensory deprivation. You got fewer distractions. You got fewer things to lead you astray that you start thinking, you know, it's, you start investing all your time and effort into certain distractions so that you don't have time really to contemplate Dhamma or practice Dhamma correctly. So, I mean, with regard to having sex, I mean, it's not just that you're sitting there and then you have sex and then afterwards you're just sitting there again. It's like there's all this time and effort involved in, you know, courting a woman or at least picking up a drunk one in a bar and there's money to be spent. You gotta like earn money, you gotta have a job in order to pay for this stuff. And just entertainment, it depends on what kind of entertainment, I suppose. I do watch entertainment shows occasionally, but, um, it's just all this distraction and you think it's reality the more you're you buy into it the more you think that this is reality and most western buddhists are just so programmed by just western empirical science and materialism and so forth that they just assume this is reality maybe if they're being philosophical they'll admit that it isn't but most of the time they just take it they take it for granted that laws of physics are laws of reality. And it's just, you just get, the more stuff you've got going on, the more you're pretty much compelled to buy into the whole illusion that the virtual reality isn't virtual. And I'm waving my arms around a lot today, I've noticed. And you can see it in better resolution now because of the new video recording software that I hope is working and probably is. So how much of a difference does sense restraint make on practice as a lay person or as a monk really, as, as, a, as a sentient being? Yeah, I mean, the simpler you've got things, the easier it is not to be distracted by, you know, samsaric phenomena and start thinking that they are real. Maybe if you're watching an entertainment show and Let's say you're watching a movie, but you've always got the critical like detachment. Then, then that's not so bad. I mean, that might actually be helpful in certain ways. Like I've, I've said this before, but my mother used to say that my father could totally ruin a movie. She'd be getting into it, you know. And my father would just make this observation, like they didn't have guns like that in those days. You know, it's like you, you're just. The bullshit detector is always turned on and you're just waiting for some anachronism or something to happen. You know, it's like the camera's panning out and you hit, see this bump, like the camera just rolled over a wire or something. It's like, ah, look at that. And to have that kind of approach towards the world in general is actually, I mean, it's kind of cynical, I suppose, but actually it can be beneficial in Dhamma. So watching movies with that kind of attitude it's, it could be practice for, for just watching the world in general. <clears throat> but sense restraint, yeah, it's, I mean, that's just like stage two of renunciation. The purpose of renunciation is sense restraint for the most part. It's just simplifying things radically so that you're not getting just led astray by all these distractions and taking them seriously and getting sucked into the delusion that they are real. So simplify your life as much as possible if your if your sweetheart will let you or your mate in general so i think i'll just move on to the next question here this is also from siovaksh and sipa zidana and he says 
In a discussion you are having in the comment section with one of your viewers, you cited how the average Brahmin had red hair and blue eyes. I could not find a source for this claim anywhere. Can you please tell me where you saw this? The reason I'm asking is because this doesn't make much sense, as the early Indo-European groups, Yamnaya Kurgan tribes, all had dark hair and eyes. The relative non-existence of the alleles for them compared to how widespread the R1A paternal ancestry is in North India makes me doubt that claim. Light eyes seems to be a result of later migrations from Central Asian groups like the Scythians who are mixed with Central Europeans. Well, this, of course, also is just taking for granted that scientific materialism is gospel truth. But I'm pretty sure... I mean, I haven't read Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. I think it's Yoga Sutras and not Yoga Shastras. Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. I've read at least once. I think it was more than one source saying that, that Patanjali in his Yoga Sutras describes the stereotypical Brahmin as having like ruddy hair and blue eyes. I didn't read it myself, at least I didn't read the Yoga Sutras myself, but that is a statement that I have come across. And it may be that by the time the Indo-Europeans, the Indo-Aryans invaded India, they weren't just pure-blooded Yamnaya Kurgan tribes anymore, that they had you know, already intermixed with proto-Scythians, like the Andro Novo culture was proto-Scythian, I'm pretty sure. Maybe they already got some blue eyes there. And then, you know, it'd be really the, the elite, the ruling elite that were more likely to have these more or less European features in ancient times. So I don't know. It may be that it's just somebody, it's a spurious quote that more than one person has quoted in their own books. Or it may be like by the time that the the Indo-Aryans invaded North India, that there was already an intermixture of more fair-haired, fair-skinned, blue-eyed people that had somehow gotten into the ruling elite of these Indo-Aryans. But I'm pretty sure that the it was attributed to Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. I think it's Yoga Sutras or Yoga Shastras, whichever it was that he wrote. So, let's see here. I guess I guess I answered that. So I'll just move on to Siovaksh and Sipat Zidana's next question, which is, can you please do a breakdown and explanation of the gradual training process step by step that is mentioned in the suttas? And I mean, in the suttas, there is a gradual training process taught by the Buddha, it's called Anupubasika. And it turns out that there's not just a standardized one way of describing it, there's various ways of describing the gradual training, which always starts with ordination and renunciation. But uh, I think one of the main sources of like the most standardized list, the closest list of the gradual training that is mentioned in the suttas would be what Majjhimedakaya number 51, which I have actually have right here. Let's see here. Yeah, the Kandaraka Sutta. And let's see, where does it start? It has to start with renouncing the world. Yeah, it starts with renouncing the world. And then, uh, yeah, he abstains from killing living beings, which is another step. And then he abandons false speech. He abstains from injuring seeds and plants. He practices eating in only one part of the day. I mean, there's this, this long list of this gradual thing, the gradual practice here. He becomes content with robes to protect his body with all food to maintain his stomach. Oh, uh, let's see, sense restraint and uh, like mindfulness and full awareness. Yeah, but I think a lot of this is just arbitrary. It's not really a sequential sequence. Well, what did I just really say that? Sequential sequence? It's not really 
you know, sort of a, a temporal sequence where first you do this and then you do that and then you do that. It's, it's just listing off almost at random all these practices that a monk is supposed to do. And I mean, to some degree, it may be that the more advanced ones are later on. It's got mindfulness and full comprehension, you know, after, after renouncing the world. I mean, it starts with renouncing the world. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's just page after page of all these things that a monk does in the, in the gradual training, at least in Sutta 51 of the Majjhima Nikaya. It's just, yeah, he, abs he abstains from injuring seeds and plants. He practices eating only one meal a day. Let's see, he abstains from dancing, singing music, and theatrical shows. He abstains from wearing garlands, smartening himself with scent, and embellishing himself with unguents. He abstains from high and large couches. That's like essentially eight precepts. He abstains from accepting gold and silver. Well, ten precepts. He abstains from accepting raw grain. He abstains from accepting raw meat. He abstains from accepting women and girls, which I assume would be slave women, slave girls. No, oh, wait. He abstains from accepting men and women slaves. There we go. He, ex he abstains from accepting goats and sheep. And it's just page after page of these things that a monk is abstaining from. So I don't think it's going to work for me to give a, a breakdown and explanation step by step that is mentioned in the suttas. And this is just one version in Majjhima Nikaya number 51. It's just one version. But when I first saw the, the question, uh, I had a little confusion in my mind. Maybe he was referring to the the gradual teaching rather than the gradual training. And I got another book here, the Buddhist Dictionary. I mean, anyone who's serious about studying Theravada, like philosophical terms and so forth, hold it right way up there. It's a good book to have. Sometimes you can get it for free distribution too. But then also there's the, yeah, the Anupobi Kata which is how the Buddha would like convert people by giving the gradual discourse. And that's, it's, it's kind of interesting. I, I, I was more influenced, more impressed by that and then by this gradual training, which is just page after page of, you know, the monk abstains from this and he abstains from that and he, abstains, and he does, you know, mindfulness and so forth, which is, again, it's not some kind of sequence. It's just almost like a random assemblage of just stuff that monks are supposed to do. It's kind of like the silas in the, the first several um, suttas of the of the Diganikaya. It's just, you know, the, the all of these lists of things that monks do and aren't uh, and don't do. Let's see. But then like the Anupobi Gita, the gradual instruction, which is uh, it's called a progressive sermon. See, given by the Buddha when it was necessary to prepare first the listener's mind before speaking to him on the advanced teaching of the Four Noble Truths. And the stock passage runs as follows. Then the Blessed One gave him a gradual instruction, that is to say, he spoke on giving, or dana, on moral conduct, or sila, and on the heavens, or sega. He explained the peril, the vanity, and the depravity of sensual pleasures, and the advantages of renunciation. When the Blessed One perceived that the listener's mind was prepared, pliant, free from obstacles, elevated and lucid, then he explained to him that exalted teacher, particular to the Buddhas, that is, suffering, its cause, its ceasing, and the path. So it may be that Siovaksha and Sipat Ziduna um, had this in mind, like the, the gradual instruction, or he may have had like a, a simplified version of the gradual training that is way more simplified than the page after page that is given in Sutta 51, which is considered to be like one of these standard sources on the gradual training. So, I mean, if you really want to know the gradual training uh, step by step mentioned in the suttas, read Sutta 51 of the, the Majjhima Nikaya. <clears throat> And I think I'll just move on to the next question because we got lots of questions and this is going to be a long one, I think. Okay. Although they're pretty much all long. I mean, for me, anything over half an hour is kind of long. So, next, next question is from Rui. And I apologize to Siovac and Sipad Zidna if I did not do justice to that question. Although, 
I, I had many more words in my answer than were in the question here. So there is that. So next question is from Rui and Rui says, what do you think of the so-called fourth turn of the wheel? Traditionally, for example, in academia, Dzogchen would be the putative fourth turn. However, some now claim that the variegated cocktail of Western Buddhism, he's got parent, he's got quotation marks on that, Western Buddhism is the actual fourth spin. It is as if there is a reified wheel that people can walk up to and go, geez, let me give it a whirl. Well, I mean, Theravada Buddhism really does not have any concept of anything beyond the, the, the starting of the turning of the wheel. The Buddha got the wheel rolling. You know, it probably, it just keeps turning. It's not like it turns once and then you get Mahayana and then it turns again. And I don't know what the third turn would be even, because this is all Mahayana metaphors, I'm pretty sure. So with regard to Zogchen being the fourth turn of, of the wheel of Dharma, um, it's, it's all arbitrary. I mean, it's all academic. I mean, it just depends on who's coming up with the system. Like Theravada wouldn't consider Mahayana to be any kind of significant you know, progression or improvement on Buddhism. I assume some kind of Mahayana would be the second turning, wouldn't it? I would, I would assume. But yeah, it's, it's just not a Theravada Buddhist concept. And so, I mean, the Buddha started the wheel turning and it, it just keeps turning. You know, it's not like it turns once and then you get a different kind of Buddhism and then it turns again, you get a different kind of Buddhism, like some kind of, again, you got like a sequential progression that, uh, yeah, I assume the Mahayana Buddhists would like that idea because, you know, then they consider Mahayana to be more advanced than Theravada, you know, Hinayana, the deficient vehicle. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's completely arbitrary and academic. And uh, even if there, it was real, then Western Buddhism is a, a flat tire, I think. At least the academic queer Buddhism and just everything is optional and, you know, monks should be abolished and all that kind of stuff. The second noble truth needs to be revised so that patriarchy can be a cause of suffering and, and on and on. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's a broken wheel right there. So I think I'll just move on to the next question. This is from Andrea. And Andrea says, Do you know Hillside Hermitage in Slovenia? The head monk there is Ajahn Yanamoli Taro, seems to have a very unique view on the jhanas and the Buddha's teachings in general. He basically says that the majority of the monks practice and interpret the suttas in a wrong way. According to his teachings, the jhanas are more a constant state in daily life instead of some mystical experiences during meditation. What are your views on this? And are you familiar with his books and teachings? They also have a YouTube channel. Well, I have seen Nyanamoli, Tara, um, and some of the other monks at the Hillside Hermitage on YouTube videos. That's my only exposure to him. Plus, people talking about him in the Discord server. Some of the members of the Discord server associated with me or my channel and, and so forth um, they're impressed by Nyanamoli because he does seem to be a serious practitioner and he teaches a lot based on his own experience and not just from books. But one problem with monks who base their teachings on their own experience, um, like a lot of Thai Ajans who really were adept at meditation and so forth, they still get the Pali wrong because, you know, they're not scholars so much as their practitioners. And so they'll just reinterpret well-known doctrines in a different way and think they've got it right when probably they don't. I mean, it doesn't disqualify them from being meditation masters. It just means that they're just sort of trying to reinterpret the text in accordance with their own experiences, which isn't totally horrible, but still, um, yeah, it, it can result in confusion and so forth. Um, I have not been exposed to Ajahn Yanamoli's um, idea that jhana is just 
a mental state that you have going all the time. I assume some people get into advanced jhana states and they can stay in that state if they're really advanced and while they're moving around and making noise and all that. Whereas most people, they attain jhana, they're probably sitting in meditation. At least if it's the meditation that caused the jhana, then yeah, they're going to be sitting there not doing anything. So let's see here. <clears throat> uh, yeah, this is the second Nyanamoli, the second famous Nyanamoli. The first famous Nyanamoli was Osbert Moore, I think was his name. He was, he was British and he was ordained in Sri Lanka and he died around 1960, I think. He's the one who translated a lot of obscure, difficult texts, including the Wisudi Maga. But uh, Ajahn, the second Ajahn Nyanamoli, or the second Nyanamoli, um, yeah, he's he's kind of buff. He looks like he works out or something, or he's just naturally high T. You know, he's got good muscle tone and seems kind of macho and probably fairly ascetic, which is what you would expect from uh, a macho monk. Um, but he says the majority of the monks practice and interpret the suttas in a wrong way. Well, I mean, that can be taken in different ways. I mean, if he's insisting that his way is the only right way, then yeah, that is that is not so good either. Because, you know, it's like the stereotypical fool in the suttas is the one who says, only this is true, everything else is wrong. But, I mean, he might just be making a standard observation that the majority of monks practice and interpret the suttas in a wrong way just because they're not really practicing or interpreting the suttas very much at all because they're just following along with the standard routine at their monastery, not meditating much, if at all. And, uh, you know, they're just repeating stuff from books that they don't really understand. I mean, to that extent, I would agree with him. But um, you got to be careful of anyone who's who's claiming that, you know, only they are interpreting things correctly. So, I'm sh not sure what the question is here. Oh, what are your views on this? And you are you familiar with his books and teachings? I think most jhana is, med it's a med they are meditative states. I think some adepts can maintain like higher jhanas even when they're they're moving around. I'm not so sure about fourth jhana where it, which is I mean you're essentially in a state of voidness. But then again, he probably has a different interpretation of it. But for like a really profound mystical state, I don't think you're going to be like talking with your buddies when you're in a profound mystical state unless you are just super advanced and just maintain it no matter what you're doing. Like maybe a fully enlightened being. So, golly. Yeah, I really don't know that much about Nyanamoli. So, I know more about the first Yanamoli than the second Yanamoli because I've only seen a few of his YouTube videos and heard very little about him in, in a Discord server. So, I guess I sh shouldn't try to answer the question too much beyond my capacity to answer the question. So, I'll just move on to the next question here. This is from Indian Guy, known to some as Trevor. An Indian Guy says, If you had to add it all up, how much money did you spend to become live and leave the monastic life well when i first became a monk i had about seven thousand bucks in cash and i just donated that and my pickup truck to the monastery and uh how much so that's how much money it took for me to become a monk and i didn't have to pay that i just it was voluntary also i was like a monastery attendant for a couple months before i was ordained as a monk so that was sort of contributing, you know, cooking and washing dishes and driving the monks around, and, you know, cleaning the bathrooms and stuff. I did that for a few months. But with regard to money, I donated, I think if I remember correctly, it was like $7,000 plus a pickup truck, but it was just totally voluntary donation on my part. With regard to how much money did I spend to live as a monk? Zero, because monks aren't allowed to spend money. So other people spent money on me and I don't know, you know, I wouldn't even begin to estimate how much money was spent on me as a monk. It wouldn't have been a whole heck of a lot because I had simple, I lived a very simple life. And for the most part, I was living in Burma with no electricity and no running water and no rent to pay, 
you know, I'd have to get my visa renewed once a year. Um, doctors would treat me for free. Dentists would treat me for free. Uh, at least some of them would. So, so okay, so I spent $7,000, just voluntarily just donated it when I became a monk. While I was a monk, I spent zero, except for right at the very end. This is when I was you know, preparing to, to leave the monastery. Then I think um, it was another like $7,000 that people had donated on my behalf. And some of it they donated after I left the monastery, just out of the kindness of their heart and the desire to help me get started again. So... So with regard to becoming a monk, I spent 7,000 in a pickup truck, which were voluntary. Um, for the whole 30 years that I was a monk, you know, it was like I spent essentially zero. And then to leave the monastic life, it was like another $7,000 that people donated to me, partly just to help me get started with a new life, which uh, was very generous and good hearted of them, I must say. So I think I'll just move on to the next question. This is from Don. And Don says, Have you ever heard of any Theravadan monks attaining rainbow body? It's, it's just one. For some reason, he's just got one set of quotes here. Have you ever heard of any Theravadan monks attaining rainbow body or light body when they died? If this is a real phenomenon, he's got phenomena. If this is a real phenomenon, supposedly attained by advanced Tibetan monks, why would the Buddha himself or his disciples not have achieved such a state? I'm unaware of any such stories, but I'm no scholar. Is there anything at all about it in the Theravadan tradition? If not, how come? If it's an actual thing, do you believe it's real? Well, I have no idea what the rainbow body is. I assume it doesn't have anything to do with, with gayness. So, yeah. I've never heard of any Theravadan monks attaining the rainbow body. I don't even know what the rainbow body is. And it's just not a Theravada Buddhist thing. So uh, if this is a real phenomenon supported, supposedly attained by advanced Tibetan monks, why would the Buddha himself or his disciples not have achieved such a state? Well, the concept of it hadn't been invented yet or something, or maybe it was a Tibetan shamanistic thing that got incorporated into Tibetan Buddhism when Tibetan Buddhism incorporated shamanistic elements into the system. Um, but yeah, there's no mention at all in the Pali text of anybody attaining the rainbow body. <clears throat> I'm, I can virtually guarantee that. Let's see. So if not, how come, if it's an actual thing, it can, may be an actual thing, but it could be like the crystals or the, the subatomic particles in the, that Rupert Sheldrake talks about that, you know, they may have not existed then, but then once somebody comes up with the idea and starts looking for it or cultivating it and they, they come across it, they attain it or whatever, and then it becomes a thing. It's, it's morphic resonance maybe. But I mean, generally it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's just kind of, mind made you know this world is mind made that's that's uh verse one of the dhammapada you know what is it mind is the forerunner of all things they are their mind is chief they are mind made regardless of r1a alleles and so forth and regardless of regardless of anything really so yeah, rainbow body. Okay, so the, the next question is, 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 is approximately as weird. This is, I've never heard of this next one either. This is from Don also. And he says, Do you know anything about Lek Lai, the mysterious metal that is mined by chanting Buddhist monks in Southeast Asia for amulets and such? I saw a video where monks were extracting the stuff from a cave literally by chanting, and the stuff seemed to be miraculously coming out of the rock. It even looked like it was moving like a living thing. Huh, I wonder if it was like mercury that was just flowing there. Golly. <clears throat> Lek Lai, yeah, I'm, I don't think it's a thing in Burma. 
that uh, I've never heard of monks mining anything in Burma. In fact, I've never really heard of monks mining anything, period. Lek Lai or anything else. Um, I did hear about a monk that was, he was like an alchemist kind of monk who was making these amulets out of this mysterious kind of metal. And this might have something to do with this. But he was making amulets of these, uh, this mysterious kind of metal. And uh, finally, somebody figured out that he was just melting down toothpaste tubes and making the amulets out of those. Um, people nowadays in the West, you got plastic toothpaste tubes, but those of you who are old enough or have lived in like un relatively undeveloped countries know that toothpaste tubes used to be like this really soft metal, like it had lead in it or something. So... Yeah, it could just be some kind of weird hoax that uh, monks are doing to make themselves look mysterious, which is sort of flirting with excommunication if they're Theravada monks. Or maybe they really sincerely believe in this stuff, and who knows, maybe their belief and their, their samadhi is strong enough that they can actually make a mysterious metal levitate out of caves. But I've never heard of it. And I don't know where it would be on the, uh, the periodic the periodic ch table you know what what elements what kind of metal it is i have no idea so i think i'll just move on to the next one because this is this is too esoteric and far out for me rainbow bodies and lick line mysterious levitating metal so i'll just move on to the proto pseudo monk who says if a wise monk dedicates themselves purely to meditation, but then can't teach the truth to anyone. In contrast, the scholar monk has proficiency in the words that point to the truth, but has no realization of it. Can this be said to be wisdom? Well, the monk who remains silent may be truly wise. He may be a sage. You know, Pacheca Buddhas are supposed to be that way. Some of the, the Zen masters that you read about, like there was one Zen master who you know, any, any time anyone asked him about Dharma or anything, he would just pull a flute out of his robes and, and like two one one note on it and then just walk away. So it may be that he was just concealing the fact that he didn't know or maybe he really was like an enlightened sage. It's really hard to tell reading, you know, modern English translations of medieval Chinese texts. So, but I mean, the main question, well, no, I won't even try to presume to say that I know what the main question is here. Let's see. They can't, you got a, a wise monk, can't teach the truth to anyone. And then in contrast, you've got the scholar monk who has proficiency in the words that point to the truth, but has no realization of it. Can this be said to be wisdom? So I guess the main question here is, is a scholar monk who is able to explain what the texts say, is this monk wise? And then um, sort of as a sub question here, I assume this is a corollary to the preceding question is, is Bhikkhu Bodhi a wise monk? Well, I would say it takes a certain amount of wisdom to recognize wisdom. You know, so Bhikkhu Bodhi may be wiser than the average person, but with regard to Dharma, I do not consider him to be particularly wise. Um, I mean, he's just been sucked into leftist politics, essentially. You know, he's he's actually been speaking, you know, in advocacy of women's reproductive rights, which is essentially abortion. And if any woman actually did get an abortion as a result of his doing this, he would be excommunicated for life, for having essentially talked somebody into committing murder, because from the point of view of Theravada Buddhism, regardless of what the queer Buddhist academics say, regardless of how Western Buddhists feel about it, it says right in the texts that abortion is murder. Because the, let's see, rebirth linking consciousness begins at conception. A human life begins at conception according to Theravada Buddhism. And no amount of political correctness is going to change that. So is Bhikkhu Bodhi a wise monk? He's wise enough to grasp, you know, grasp the intellectual aspects of Dharma. And he's wise enough to recognize wisdom when he sees it. Generally, not always, I assume. 
but generally he's you know i mean he's wise enough to have wanted to become a monk in the first place and not just to cure himself of alcoholism or whatever you know not just because he wanted to live an easy life you know his his family disowned him because i think he was a a, a Jewish person from New York City who is devoutly Jewish parents just disown him because he became a, a Buddhist. So, I mean, he must have something going for him. He's, he's a really good translator, but that's, that's mainly intelligence more than wisdom, just the ability to translate something well. But, uh, yeah, I, I would say he has, he has some wisdom. I wouldn't consider him to be a sage. I don't think he's anywhere near to being enlightened. But, uh, you know, he's above the level of Joe Schmo, the TV repairman. So, I'm going to uh, move on to Proto Pseudo Monk's next question here, which is a, like, a follow up on the first one, I think. He says, I'm wondering how much time to study versus practice. What are the advantages and disadvantages for each route? Well, I mean, you need to study or learn why to meditate and how to meditate. And if you're going to be a monk, you need to learn, you know, the rules, how to bake a bowl, how to sew robes, you know, how to how to avoid breaking rules. But I mean, if, if you're a Dharma practitioner, you need to know how to practice, why to practice and how to practice. And that's really all you need. Because I mean, you're just going to fill your head up with all kinds of ideas. And some of the I mean, none of the ideas are really going to apply to ultimate reality. And ideas are just kind of dangerous because you can start clinging to them and thinking that they are real. They represent reality when really it's just an idea. So uh, when I first became a monk, I was told just study no more than one hour per day and practice the rest of the time. So you need to learn the basics, you know, how and why to meditate or how and why to practice other aspects of dharma like generosity and so forth um, which is relatively simple and straightforward i mean if you have troubles in your meditation you may have to meet with a teacher or or you know look it up in a book you're better off with a, a living teacher if you can find one who is qualified to deal with your your issues Books can be excellent teachers, but they don't, they're not very responsive to an individual person's needs. So, yeah, I mean, the advantages of practice, I mean, there's no real disadvantage of practice unless you're practicing ignorantly and you've got like a, you're, you've been following a method that really is not going to get you very far or can even lead you astray. You know, you're, you're practicing for the wrong reasons. You know, you're trying to generate psychic powers by, you know, chanting some weird mantra or something. Then, yeah, that you might need a little more study to understand Dhamma better. But, yeah, you, you don't really need to study Dhamma all that much. You know, like, an, like my teacher was saying, like an hour a day is probably sufficient. And that's, that's if you're really going for it. So disadvantages of, of studying too much. First of all, you're robbing yourself of the time to practice. And also you just start clinging to these ideas which are not the same as reality and start just getting, you're invested in all this learning. And it's, it's you know, it's like the story of uh, Potila in the, in the commentaries, in the Dhammapada commentary where the Buddha would just call him, you know, pointless Potila. You know, here, here comes pointless Potila. You know, there goes pointless Potila. And po Potila, I mean, the whole story is an anachronism because Potila was an expert in the Tipitaka. You know, he had he'd gotten it all down. You know, he was teaching the Tipitaka to his students and so forth. When in the Buddhist time, there was no Tipitaka, especially there was no Abhidhamma Pitaka yet. And so finally, Potila started thinking, wow, maybe there's something to this. And he decided he better find himself a meditation teacher that he was spending too much time studying and teaching stuff in the texts although you know texts didn't really exist yet at the time and so finally he uh he goes to this monastery a long distance away it doesn't really explain why he went so far and uh 
you know, all the monks there just refused to teach him because, you know, you're a senior to us and you're very learned and learned monks are, are hard to teach because they are, they're already full of these ideas. So finally he got taught this relatively simple yet profound meditation technique from this little child novice who was already fully enlightened. Or also this, this, it reminds me of, um, it's one of the first stories in, in, uh, 101 Zen stories by, uh, in, in the book, Zen Flesh, Zen Bones, which was pretty much the book that converted me to Buddhism. Zen Flesh, Zen Bones, compiled by Paul Reps. And there's a well-known story at the beginning where a scholar comes to discuss philosophy with a Zen master. And the Zen master sits him down and gives him a, a tea cup and then starts pouring tea into the cup and just keeps pouring and pouring. And the, the tea is overflowing the cup and spilling out onto the table. And the Zen master just keeps pouring till finally the scholar is saying, why, why do you keep pouring that? It's, it's, it's full, you know, no more will go in. And then the, the Zen master says, well, your, your mind is the same way. Your mind is already so full of, of information and ideas and beliefs that, you know, nothing I teach you is going to have much effect. It's, it's you know, it's no more will go in. And that's, that's one of the main disadvantages of studying is you think you've got it figured out. You think you know it when really it's just you're parroting somebody else's ideas. Or, I mean, even if you come up with your own ideas, it's just still at the, at the level of ideas. You know, it's not reality. And if you want to know reality, you have to experience it directly, which is going to be through meditative means rather than through reading books. Although sometimes I have to admit, you just sometimes you just come across the one book that you really need to you really need to read and it can just change the way you look at things so i guess i'll just move on to uh, the proto pseudo monks next question which is in the experience of nibbana is there awareness or does one transcend even awareness is there memory how do you think nibbana is stored processed in the brain maybe with Neuralink, we could copy the brain signals of an arahant and download nibbana into all beings then the arahants will be mere bodhisattva then will be more bodhisattva than bodhisattvas doing the real work i used to have kind of that idea where you know you could just replicate the, the the brain signals of an arahant in in somebody else and turn their brain into an arahant brain but i mean first of all we just don't have the karma for that so it's not it's not going to happen our own karma will prevent that from happening in one way or another but getting back to the top part of this question is the experience of nibbana in the experience of nibbana is there awareness or does one transcend even awareness um is there memory how do you think nibbana is stored or processed in the brain? Well, nibbana is not stored or processed in the brain. It's just completely at a different level of reality. It's off the scale. It's not part of samsara. And so, I mean, it's not going to be stored or processed in the brain. So there would be no memory either. No memory in nibbana. Nibbana is undifferentiated. You know, there's no distinction of this from that. One synonym of Nibbana is Nipapancha, which just means no differentiation. So if there is any awareness, then it would be undifferentiated, pure awareness with no real distinct content. It wouldn't be awareness of this or that or anything else. It would just be just pure undifferentiated awareness, which would be like hegel's pure being which would be indistinguishable from pure non-being because there's no discernible content at all it's just off the scale but i don't think the neural link thing is going to work i mean with regard to producing arahants how you doing my dog is watching me so i think i'll just move on to the next question you want to say hi to everybody okay okay uh, uh, this is Tater, my dog. She's saying hi. Look at, see, she's saying hi. Okay. Uh, in case you didn't notice, she has one brown eye and one blue eye, uh, and a head shaped like a potato. So we'll just move on to the next question here. This is from Hereward the Wake. 
And here where the wake says, in Q&A number 74, you mentioned in passing that the gods in Buddhism had no interactions with humans. But in the well-known story of Prince Vesandra, the Vesandra Jataka, the god Indra appears to the prince and demands that he gives up his wife and children. The story is sometimes compared to the sacrifice Abraham is commanded to make that rides roughshod over Western sensibilities, particularly current Western sensibilities. Is this an exception in the Pali canon, therefore? Well, I don't think that I said that the gods in Buddhism had no interactions with humans because that's clearly not the case if you read the texts. Gods are continually having interactions with monks, with the Buddha. I mean, you read the Jatakas, the Indra or, or Saka king of gods actually came down and was hanging out with, with a rabbit you know, because you had the wise rabbit that, uh, <clears throat> let's see, there was this wide, the, the Sasa Jataka. Sasa means hair. So I guess he was a hare, not a rabbit. There is a difference. So you have this wise hare who was the Buddha in a previous existence. And he was he was being austere, this, this hare was. And that causes Saka's throne to heat up. He's got this stone, this, this throne made of yellow stone. And it heats up and it's uncomfortable for him to sit on it when humans or people down on earth, or in this case, hares, are being too saintly and austere you know they're 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 generating tapas which is sort of like a ascetic ascetic heat tapas literally means heat but it could also mean like uh, like rigorous austerity and so um the king saka king of gods disguises himself as a like a brahmin mendicant and comes down and the rabbit or the hare i should say um, had made a vow that he was going to offer food to any mendicant that came along, but because mendicants don't generally eat rabbit food, he was going to sacrifice his own body and serve his own meat. And that's that's what was heating up the throne was this this intention to do this, and so Saka, king of gods, disguises himself as the Brahmin mendicant and tests the hare, and the hare just jumps right into the fire to cook himself. How, how a hare even had a fire going. It doesn't explain that part. And he just wouldn't cook because, of course, Saka, king of gods, wouldn't let the rabbit or the hare, I should say, f burn up in the fire. And then as a reward for this, Saka, king of gods, took a, took a mountain, squeezed the juice out of this mountain, and then made the, the symbol of the rabbit on the face of the moon, which is how you get the idea that the Buddha is the man in the moon because... He was a rabbit or a hare, I should say, in a previous life. And then he got his image put on the surface of the moon. And if you look at the moon, look at it kind of tilt your head like kind of like this. It does look like a rabbit. It looks more like a rabbit than a human face. So, I mean, the gods are continually coming down, especially, I mean, well, I, I should just back up. I've, I've just been yammering away about gods interacting with people and rabbits. Hares, I should say. But the thing is, most, I think the point I was making at the time in, in Q&A number 74 is that for the most part, Davis don't have any interest in us. You know, they've got their own lives to live. They've got their celestial palaces and, and, and nymphs and stuff or whatever it is. You know, they could be a pulsating geometric pattern or something. <clears throat> you know, they don't have any interest in us, but some do. They might have been human in a previous existence. They might still have a certain attachment or concern with humans in general or with certain humans. For example, one of my favorite suttas is the Bahia Sutta, which is Udana 110. You've got this ascetic, he's not a Buddhist, he's living on the west coast of India, and he's he thinks that he's enlightened, but then a deva who used to be one of his relatives in a previous life uh, comes to him and says, "No, you're really not. A, you're really not enlightened." But there is this Gautama Buddha who lives in the Ganges Valley who is enlightened, and so then Bahi. That's what inspired Bahi to just pack up his stuff and immediately head head towards the Buddha in order to, to learn from him. And uh, I mean, sometimes you've got like Mahamogalana or the Buddha himself going up into heaven and interacting with gods up there. 
but usually they're coming down here. And of course, you've got tree dwelling deities and so forth, like nature deities, but the lower levels of of, de- of small g gods, they're like nature spirits, they're interacting with people. But for the most part, most non-human, like, like small g gods, beings that are higher up than us on the scale, they really don't have any more interest in us than we would have in a family of squirrels living in a park half, you know, half a mile down the road. There might be a few people who are really into feeding squirrels, so they'll, they'll go down there and, and feed the squirrels or whatever. But for the most part, most gods, most superhuman beings really don't give a shit about us. They don't hate us or love us or anything. It's just, you know, it's like a family of squirrels in a park half a mile from here. Or an anthill or something. So, let's see, where's the question here? Is this an exception to the poly canon, therefore? No, there's there's plenty of stories in the poly texts about gods and especially monks interacting. And, like, Mara also is a god, and he's continually coming down and trying to influence people. Like, lead them astray and keep them from becoming enlightened, mainly. So, yeah. So, I mean, if I did say that gods in Buddhism have no interactions with humans, I misspoke. But probably I was saying that for the most part, they have no interest in us. And so we don't pray to them. You know, Buddhists don't pray to the, to the gods. They don't make sacrifices to the gods. Um, unless it's like in Burma, you've got the Nat cult, which was like the religion of Burma before they converted to Buddhism. And it's just sort of vestigial, still exists there. And they'll make little offerings to some deity or other, you know, just so they'll have a safe trip when they drive to Mandalay and back, something like that. <clears throat> but uh, in Buddhism, like Orthodox mainstream Buddhism, you don't pray to the gods, you don't, and you don't make offerings to them because they really don't have much interest in us and they really don't have the power to alter our destiny because our destiny is made by our own karma so that, that was the main point i'm pretty sure so i'll just move on to the next question here and this is from keep Divinia. and keep Divinia says would you have eaten a plant as a monk that would have reduced your libido at times when you were extremely horny or would this be cheating i don't know I'll tell you the truth, that's kind of a, a weird question and I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, there was this one medicine that I took that completely abolished my libido. It was it was a, it was called Yetsa. It's it's lick salt, literally in in Burmese, translated into English, lick salt. It's kind of medicine where you pour a little bit into your hand and you lick it up, and it's kind of salty. It's, it's tastes kind of like hard boiled egg yolk too. It's got I don't know what ingredients in it. But uh, I got this special kind. It was like Five Tigers brand Lick Salt. And one of my supporters warned me that there was some ingredient in there that was deadly poison. But I'm thinking they wouldn't be selling the stuff if it was like killing off all their customers. So I tried it because I was having like an indigestion problem. You know, I'd be eating a belly full of food because a monk only, well, at least I as a monk ate only one meal a day. So you eat a full day's supply of food in one sitting. And then sometimes it just won't digest. It's like you, you, your belly is too full. You know, it's sort of like your mouth is too full. You can't chew. Your stomach gets too full. It can't digest. I was, I was having problems with that. So I took some of this Five Tigers brand Lick Salt and... Um, it one, one of the symptoms, I mean, it worked like a charm for helping me digest my food. That was no problem at all. But it also abolished my libido for days. And also, I just broke out in this rash all over my body. It started on my tongue and like the, the lining of my mouth and then spread from there throughout my entire body. And it was horrible. <clears throat> and I'm not even sure why I'm explaining all this to you. But I did miss... I mean, to have my libido just just essentially evaporate, I, I missed it. I mean, it's life without libido is just it just seems so vapid and empty and pointless <laughs> in a way. You know, I think Freud kind of I don't think that Freud was really authoritative on a lot of things, but uh, he he kind of 
sort of was right on that one that libido is just like built in and it's like your sex drive is is what's pushing you through life i'm pretty sure freud said something along those lines and there is something to that but uh, would i have eaten a plant as a monk that would have reduced my libido i don't know see that's that's the weird thing about this question is maybe i would maybe i wouldn't it would depend on what kind of mood i was in or something man I don't know what the plant would be though. Are there are there any libido reducing plants? I've I've heard that like uh, saltpeter, like potassium nitrate, has a libido reducing quality to it, which was causing soldiers back in the 1700s to be eating black powder, which has ammonium nitrate in it, to just reduce their sex drive so that they won't be uh, seeing their their comrades in arms as strangely attractive. So. I guess I'll just move on to the next question because I really don't know if I would have taken the plant. It would depend on the circumstances, what kind of plant it was, you know, all this kind of stuff. You know, what were the side effects? What did other people who had taken it before have to say about it? That kind of thing. So I'll just move on to keep the... Ah! What are you doing? Stop it! Ah! Man, all of a sudden they decided to start playing right behind me. Stop playing! Get serious! Silly dogs. Stop it. Oh, man. Okay, keep Davinia's next question. Were there no monasteries in the mountains of Burma where you could have stayed during heat periods? Actually, yeah, like Shan, the whole Shan Plateau in Western Burma is like a 4,000 foot high plateau. And uh, it's relatively cool up there. It gets down to about freezing in the wintertime. And there was a monastery there that was set up especially for Western monks in the Tongpulu tradition. It was near the town of Meimyo, which is now called Pien Uluin. And it was originally set up by the British during British colonial times by uh, Colonel May. That's why it was called Meimyo, which means May town. And it was set up as a hill station for Burmese army officers getting out of the blazing furnace-like heat of central Burma during the hot season. And uh, not far from there, there was a monastery. Like I said, set up for monks like me, Western monks ordained in the Tompulu tradition. But um, in, my, in the early years, my early years as a monk in Burma, the, the abbot there, just he was, he was a Western monk too, he was the senior monk there, and he just talked all the time. And usually it wasn't about Dhamma. He'd be talking about some really good cricket bat that he used to have or, or like motorcycle riding and stuff that he did before he was a monk and just gossip and this kind of stuff. And I would just kind of avoided the monastery most of the time just because this, the abbot was always like coming over and wanting to hang out and just talk all the time. But um, like the last monastery I stayed at in Burma before, before coming back to America the last time was that same monastery after the, that monk had uh, left. So yeah, there are places in Burma, like Burma is surrounded by mountain ranges. And so there are places in the mountains where you can go. I mean, some of the mountains areas, like in the, in the West, it's like the hill tribes are, have, were converted to Christianity by missionaries in British colonial times mostly. But uh, like the Shan Plateau, the Shans are Buddhist. So yeah, you can do that. It's, the thing is, it's too cold in the winter time for to be living without electricity and, and like just heating water like in at that monastery that I was staying at. I mean, you you'd take a bucket and then you light candles underneath the bucket. And that would warm up the water just warm enough that you could pour it over yourself without going into some kind of shock or just keeling over dead or or something approximately as unpleasant because it was i mean taking a shower in ice water is not pleasant that was about the only time that uh i i don't like being cold is when i'm bathing so but I mean, I'm, I'm giving like a 20 minute long answer to this question is, is like essentially a yes or no question. Is were there no monasteries in the mountains of Burma where you could have stayed during heat periods? And yeah, I eventually did that. I, I did try staying at Alando Kathapa National Park 
um, to get out of the, the blazing heat. But the, the rainy season there was just horrible because the Alondo Kalispa National Park is it's like two ranges of high hills shaped like a V. And I would be right in the bottom of that V where I was staying. And the wind, the monsoon wind would be blowing this way and the hills would just block all the wind. It was just like super humid and hot and just no wind at all, which is like the misery triangle. When you've got high temperature, high humidity and no wind, I mean, that's, that's just, it's not good. So let's see here. But yeah, there were places like that. And I, I stayed at one or two of them. So I'll just move on to keep the Vinia's next question. Do you know of any, well, before I, before I do that one, I would say that uh, most of the, uh, the main meditation centers now, like Mahasi and Pa'auk and Pandita Rama, that they've all got monastery branches in this same Meimyo, which is now called Pien Uluin, in that area. So it's, it's like 50 miles from Mandalay and uh, the easy access just on the, the edge of the Shan Plateau. It's more or less temperate, temperate weather there, but cold in the wintertime. Okay, so anyways, the next question <coughs> uh, from Keep Divinia is, do you know of any sutta passages that can be shown to lay people who don't care about monks to make them feel guilty? And I don't think it would be good to deliberately try to make anyone feel guilty because feeling guilty is bad karma. You're, you'd be inspiring unwholesome mental states in another person because the feeling of guilt is always bad karma. You know, remorse, regret, always bad. It's called kukucha in, in Pali and it is a negative unwholesome mental state. So you shouldn't be trying to cause anybody to feel guilty even if you know, they just murdered an entire room full of nuns and orphans. Although you really shouldn't be hanging out with people like that anyway. So let's see here. Any pseudo passages that can be shown to lay people who don't care about monks, just forget about making them feel guilty. Well, I mean, almost the entire Tipitaka is dedicated towards monks. I mean, the Buddha himself was a monk, you know, like all of his first disciples were monks that Buddhism was designed for monks by a monk. So, I mean, there are, there are books like the, the Peta Watu, the, the book of ghost stories. The, the entire purpose of that book apparently is to point out that if you're not generous and well-mannered towards monks, you get punished by your own karma. You know, you, you might be very virtuous, but then you did this one, you know, like you shafted a monk once or something, or in some cases, I mean, they do lots of merit. Like my favorite story from the Peta Watu, the, the ghost stories, this, I've, I've told this story before. I'll give just a condensed version of it. This woman, her, her, she and her husband were donating stuff to the monks all the time. And they got lots and lots of merit for, for donating monasteries and buildings and, and walking meditation paths and bringing food and, uh, and other things to the monks like pretty much every day, making offerings to the monks. They got this mountain of merit, but then she was unfaithful to him once. And then she lied to him about it and make this, made this false oath. And so because of all the merit she got for supporting monks, essentially, she lived almost like a goddess. She was living in this golden palace in the foothills of the Himalayas with this, you know, this, like a staff of, of servants. But every night she'd go into a trance and then go outside and be devoured by a big black dog. And then her bones would fall into this lotus pond where they would grow back. She'd grow a new body and then climb out and go up and back to bed again. Every night that would happen because of this one thing she did. But I mean, the whole point is that, I mean, the main purpose of that book is just pointing out the benefits of supporting monks you know, how you're going to get this mountain of merit. And if you, you do anything bad, like not supporting monks, then you get punished for it. And it's, it was probably the whole stories were just devised by wise guy monks who were trying to get people to offer them more stuff. 
But I mean, you just read the text, almost almost all suttas are dedicated to monks. And the Buddha himself was a monk. And people who don't care, who don't care about monks, especially Western Buddhists who don't care about monks, I mean, they're just misguided. They just don't get it. You know, they want this lukewarm, secular meditation method, essentially. So, yeah. Yeah, do I know of any sutta passages that can be shown to lay people who don't care about monks? Just pick a sutta at random and it'll be dedicated towards monks. And it'll be taught by a monk. You know, almost every case. There might be a few nuns. You know, there are a few nuns who, who have... Uh, taught some suttas in the texts, but you know it's ninety nine point nine percent monks. So I mean, if if they still don't get it, if they just don't want to get it. You know, they just like my experience. Some Western some Western Buddhists, not all of them, but some Western Buddhists just feel like indignant that monks even exist because it somehow makes their own lukewarmness seem not good enough. You know, it's like they're setting themselves up over us. You know, they're even dressed in these weird garments to, to separate themselves from us because they, they want to be superior to us, which isn't the truth at all. The, the, the truth is, you know, they're actually trying to practice Dhamma correctly in accordance with the texts. And that's what the texts tell them to do. And so they're doing it. And then these lukewarm people that don't want to do that resent that. That does happen, and I don't think you're going to get very far by showing them texts about how the, the Buddha was a monk and how almost everybody that he taught was a monk, at least in the texts. You know, most of the, the suttas are directed towards monks. And I don't think they really care. They say, well, that was ancient India. That, that doesn't apply anymore or something. So I guess I'll just move on to the next question here. I'm, I'm taking way too long answering each question, I think. I'm going to have to start being more concise. Just get to the point. So the next question is from Five Precept Pete. And Five Precept Pete says, In a past Q&A, you mentioned that Burmese villagers would go to the monastery and take the precepts thinking that alone is meritorious, thinking that alone is meritorious, even though they didn't intend to keep them. Could you speak to other fallacies regarding merit? Yeah, well, the Burmese do think that just the act of taking precepts, even though you have no intention of keeping those precepts, is meritorious. At least you're keeping the precepts while you're taking them. But I remember one time, this family came to visit me on Uposita Day. They took eight precepts, which includes no you know, self-beautification or anything. And just right as they're leaving, a teenage girl who was among them just saw a flower that fell from a tree on the ground, she just picked it up and put it in her hair and broke the precept. You know, they, they just think that you just get merit for doing the ceremonies. And to some degree you do, but you get more merit if you actually kept the precepts after taking them. In fact, you get more merit for keeping precepts without taking them formally at a, in during a, a ceremony or a ritual than you would by doing the ceremony and then not keeping the precepts. But they just don't see it that way. Another fallacy that they have with regard to merit is that um, it's, I've, I've talked about this before they, they can they see merit as it's, it's just kind of a transaction that it's uh, I don't know where to start with this like one example is Burmese Days by George Orwell George Orwell who wrote Animal Farm in 1984 he actually lived in Burma during British colonial times I think he was like a like a police officer near, uh, oh, where was it? Sh not Shwebo. I can't remember the name of the town. But anyway, um, the villain is Upo Chin, and he's this evil guy. And his wife, who's this humble, meek, devout Buddhist lady, keeps telling him that he's an evil man, and he's going to go to hell. And he says, oh, you don't know anything. I'm going to build a pagoda. Because the Burmese think you get so much merit for building a pagoda that it will just wash away your sins, and you're guaranteed of heaven which uh, isn't exactly true. Also, they really are, are keen on offering stuff to monks just because wise guy monks are just pounding away at how much merit they're going to get by offering stuff to monks. So that they would rather 
give a fat monk who's already got 50 bowls of food in front of him another bowl of food rather than give it to some hungry village kid who's actually hungry. So they just see it as a kind of, I mean, it's almost like money. You know, they're trying to buy a stairway to heaven, essentially. And it's all very cookbook-like and mechanistic. And you just do this, this, and this. I lived in a forest monastery where every once in a while a fortune teller would tell somebody, you need merit, you need to earn some merit, so you should rescue a chicken from a butcher and let it go at a monastery. And so they'd bring these, this little downy chick, just a few days old, and they'd, they'd want to re re release it at the monastery. And I'd tell them that that baby chicken's going to survive maybe two days tops. Because there's like hawks and falcons and monitor lizards and snakes and everything. That chicken doesn't have a chance. And they would just get like this sick look on their face. They don't want to hear this. You know, it's like the fortune teller told them to get the chicken, turn it loose at the monastery. And that by golly, that's what they're going to do. They don't care if the chicken survives. You know, they don't give a shit. That's just an inconvenience for them. So it's, yeah, it's just this idea that merit just comes from outward actions without really taking into consideration the, the mental states that are really making the karma. And any merit that is made is going to be made through mental states and not through this mechanical outward action, just following some cookbook method. I remember my, my teacher was giving a talk once on, if you want the most merit, you've got to... You've got to give or you know, do meritorious things without any idea of merit. And then it was like, <clears throat> you know, the, the people that were listening to this is like, how do I do this? I want the most merit I can. So how am I going to like not desire merit while I'm doing it in order to get the most merit? You know, it's just this weird convoluted. I mean, they're thinking of merit as a kind of cosmic money. You know, it's like spiritual money. It's essentially uh, spiritual materialism. So, yeah, I, I guess I spoke of a few other fallacies. So I'll just uh, move on to five precept Pete's next question. Did the Buddha encourage merit making or was that a later addition? Um, I think he may have encouraged merit making for the, the normie villagers. He certainly wasn't encouraging merit making for monks. I mean, a monk is supposed to go beyond merit and demerit. You know, a monk is supposed to go beyond good and evil because if you're doing, you know, evil actions, of course, you're making bad karma. If you're doing good actions, you're making good karma, but still good karma is still samsaric. It's just going to get you into heaven, which is just a higher level of samsara. So you're just trying to leave the whole system of good and bad behind. You know, you just become lawful neutral, essentially. And I'm still waving my arms around a lot. Those of you who... Uh, or just listening without watching are really missing out on all the arm waving, I have to admit. So let's see here. Yeah, so I think that it's possible. I mean, you can't really know for sure, but I do think that it's, it's very possible that the Buddha did kind of talk. I mean, it's a way of encouraging people to do good things by, you know, saying that you'll get good karma when you do these good things and it will be good for you and good things will happen to you because of this. So, I mean, that's how you would talk to, um, you know, just the illiterate villager who is never going to become a monk. He's already got a wife and five kids. You know, he's, he's a subsistence farmer. And it's just not really an option for him. So, yeah, I mean, why not? It's skillful means. And it's true, I mean, at their level, that that's what they're ready for. You know, they're not ready for nirvana yet. They're not going to attain you know, fourth jhana. They're not going to get psychic powers. So you just teach them something simple that will lead them in a good direction. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if the Buddha did encourage merit-making among lay people, but certainly not among not ordained renunciants. So I'll just move on to the next question. This is from Toronto Nat. And Toronto Nat says, how does repentance work in Theravadan Buddhism? Are there any rituals or practices that could be useful? I'm often haunted by memories where I wasn't mindful of the precepts. Well, I got to take a sip of my beverage here. Well, repentance. I was going to look this up in the dictionary. 
this, um, I should have looked up religion, and also I should have looked up repentance in the dictionary before answering this question. Repentance is really more of a Christian term. It's more of a Christian concept than a Buddhist one. And repentance seems to me that you have to have some kind of regret for what you did. Repent. You know, you got to feel sorry or guilty. You got to feel some kind of guilt. And Buddhism, Buddhist ethics just don't work that way. I was just mentioning a few minutes ago that any kind of remorse or regret or feelings of guilt are necessarily always bad karma. They just make things worse. And so it's just not recommended that you ever wallow in any kind of regret or remorse or even worry. I mean, worry is also kokucha. So you worry about the past, you know, like things that you did, or you worry about the future. I mean, it's, it's still kukucha and it's still bad karma and it just makes things worse. So, yeah, that would be the first thing I would say. I mean, that's the second most important thing I would teach any, anybody about Buddhism. First most important thing is desire is the cause of all suffering. Whenever you are unhappy, it's because you are craving something. It may be at a subliminal level where you're not fully aware of it, but still it's there. And secondly, the second thing I would teach anybody about Buddhism, if you only know two things about Buddhism, one is what, what I already said, all desire is caused by desire, or all suffering is caused by desire. Second, regret, remorse, worry are always bad karma. You're always better off without them. So what happens when a a good Buddhist um, does something does something wrong, does something bad, does something unwholesome, then there's nothing at all wrong with admitting that you did it and resolving to try to do better in the future. Don't beat yourself up over it. I mean, you fall down, you just get back up again and continue moving forwards and try to be more careful about not falling down in future. So... Um, sometimes in the, in the suttas, you know, somebody will do something wrong. They'll go to a monk that they respect and essentially confess what they did for the sake of helping them to restrain themselves in future. And then the monk might say, you know, sadhu, sadhu, well done. You should restrain yourself in future and, you know, go in peace, you know, sin no more. So that's essentially the closest thing there is for, for lay people, especially monks have confession, which is now just, it's just degenerated into a ritual, blah, 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 that hardly means anything. But uh, lay, lay people or monks, if, they, if they've done something that they really think is, is bad and they, you know, they want to try and do better, then it, it may help them to just go and confess to somebody that they respect, somebody that they consider to be a wise, good person, relatively speaking, um, just as a, an, a help in, in them res, restraining themselves in future, just coming clean with it and, you know, I'll try to do better. And then, you know, then the other person just says, you know, well done, you should do better. So, yeah, I think that would be my answer to this question. How does repentance work in Theravada Buddhism? Yeah, if, if repentance has any kind of feelings of guilt or remorse, then there is no repentance work in Theravada Buddhism. But there is confession. You just, you know, you just come clean with another person that you respect and just for the sake of helping you to do better in future. So the next question is from Diane. And Diane says, what is the traditional way for Buddhists to get married? And it depends on what kind of Buddhism it is. Like... In, by the time Buddhism made it to China and Japan and Korea, I'm sure that you had Buddhist priests conducting wedding ceremonies. But in Theravada Buddhism, like the earliest ancient Indian Buddhism, it was strictly prohibited for a monk to participate in a wedding ceremony. That, that was a Sangha di Sesa offense. He'd have to do penance for six days and six nights for having done that. And so Buddhism, like... Early Buddhism was a monastic renunciation system. I mean, it was it was dedicated for mainly for renunciants, and so it really doesn't want to encourage marriage, at least within the system, 
But of course, people would get married anyway, but that was just a secular thing. It was not a Buddhist thing. Marriage is secular and not like a religious function in Theravada Buddhism. And so the traditional way for Buddhists to get married, like in, in Burma, that you just go to the village headman and sign some papers and then you're married. And then after you're already married, then you throw the, the reception and then you invite monks and, and like the monk will give a sermon and bless your marriage after the deed is already done. He can't help to get you married, but after you're already married, then he can bless your marriage and you know you can earn merit by, it's, sometimes it's really cute, you know, the, the, the bride and groom They'll, you know, each be holding something that they're offering, like a set of robes, a new set of robes. You know, each one of them will be holding one end of it and offering it to the monk as kind of, you know, they're both earning merit now as as a family kind of a thing. And then they, you know, they throw a party for the whole village and they'll be cooking up vats of, of you know, bean stew and, and stuff. Rice, lots of rice. And then lots of, uh, like... Uh, rice flour cake stuff sweetened with palm palm sugar coconut palm sugar and rice flour are the three main ingredients of almost any burmese delicacy so let's see i guess i answered that it's uh yeah i mean it's not really a buddhist ceremony it's just it's just entirely secular you know it's just it's like going going to city hall to get married that's the way they do it in burma and then the monks can bless it after you're already married. And then, and see, Diane's next question here is, do Buddhists favor cremation? And yeah, they do. I mean, it, in ancient India, cremation was the general way of disposing of bodies. Um, and in Burma now, monks are cremated and the parents of monks are cremated, but everybody else is buried as a general rule, at least out in the villages. That's the way it is. So they'll bury like ordinary people, but still cremate the monks. And this, as a matter of respect for the parents of monks, they'll cremate the parents of monks too. So, but I mean, traditionally in ancient India, that was what happened. I mean, the Buddha himself was cremated. <clears throat> so yeah, the answer to that is yeah. And so I move on to the next question, which is the last question. And we've been going for almost two and a half hours. This is from White Ash Piper. And White Ash Piper says, in your talk with Brian Rue titled Cringe Buddhism, you stated that man is corrupt. In your opinion, why is this so? Well, everybody has got defilements, kilesas. Um, unless you're a perfect saint, then you're gonna have a certain amount of greed, you're gonna have a certain amount of just looking out for number one. You know, everybody's got a price and all that. I can't remember the context in which I said that people in general are corrupt, but you know, nobody is entirely pure and saintly other than a very small number of pure saints. And so it's, you know, you watch The Walking Dead. I was, I've been talking about how I was binge watching The Walking Dead. And really, I mean, it's like when civilization collapses, it's just natural that the only law remaining will be the law of the jungle. And that's just the way it is. It's going to be people are going to just, it's, they'll kill you just to take your stuff. And that's just, I mean, if civilization collapses, then it's like people's, to some degree, their true colors come out. It's like they've been following the law and not like ripping people off and you know just stealing their stuff or you know killing them and taking their stuff um just because it's against the law plus of course things are running so well that it's easier just to go to the store and buy it than to kill somebody to take his stuff but when civilization collapses then i mean people just start becoming sociopaths and it's it's always kind of the potential for that is always latent inside and you know it's it's, there is some truth in the statement that everybody has a price, you know, it's like scientists can be bought just as easily as politicians can be bought. So, I mean, trust the science is, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, it's, it's not aging well that, uh, I mean, just anybody can be corrupt. It's, yeah, I, I don't know how to answer this question. 
I don't know why I'm getting tongue tied. It's fairly straightforward, you know. It's, um, I mean, the Christians, of course, would have their own their own take on why it is that everybody is is a sinner. Buddhism, sin, and sinners are really not. It's not really Buddhist jargon, but still, we've got kilesas. That's why we're here. I mean, we're here on this world because we are not pure. We are, we're not saints. We're not sages. We're not enlightened. And so we've got greed, hate, and delusion. And sometimes the circumstances will favor that greed, hate, and delusion. So I guess that's what I, why I said it. Although, again, I, I don't recall the exact context of why I said it. But... I think it was, you know, corruption in the Catholic Church or something like that. And I was just pointing out that it's not just peculiar to Catholics, it's just peculiar to the entire human race that, that kind of stuff happens. So I guess that's it. That's that's the last question, and I think I answered it. I hope I answered your questions mostly. I hope I answered at least ninety percent of them well enough. So if you've got any more questions, feel free to ask and put them in the comments below and, and uh, hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already and check out the URL links, including the, the links to my books on Amazon. And remember that I may be tardy next week because I'm going to be traveling and I just may not get around to doing a Q&A um, at the usual time when I do a Q&A, so it may be late. And... Uh, Thank you all for uh, keeping your, your questions down to uh, three at the most. And uh, be happy. And now I'm, I've got to do the special thing right, or I stop recording. Or i got to do this, and then i got to do this. Okay.